absolutely thrilled that we have this morning kicking off the agenda someone with as much energy and insight as KP Ho. His background, you can all read the bios, but founder and chair of Banyan Tree Holdings, the leading hospitality company, and frankly, has insights into doing business in Asia, doing business globally that are second to none. So thrilled to welcome you here this morning. KP, thank you for joining. Thank you. So we, we were given this title, The Rise of the East, mm. Building Enduring Businesses in Asia. And from your perspective, it feels as though the East has already risen. Talk to us a little bit about the growth of Banyan Tree. Well, I guess the growth of Banyan Tree can be summed up in the word, um, the rise of the East. Um, when we first started in this business 30 some years ago, global tourism comprised of one color and one direction. Mm. There's generally white people in the wealthy West traveling to the rest of the exotic but unwealthy rest of the world. Yeah. Um, and the whole history of Banyan Tree in the last 30 years has been the rise of what I call rainbow tourism. In the last 20 years, and particularly, it's accelerating, even particularly after post-COVID, the acceleration has been faster of a phenomenon I call rainbow tourism. And that's multicolored tourism, meaning it's not just Caucasians traveling around the world anymore. It's the rise of yellow people, brown people, black people, pink people traveling. And that's essentially the story of a rising middle class across the rest of the world, all beginning to have the wherewithal to travel and explore the world. That's been the most exciting thing uh, in my industry and probably the most exciting story about consumerism and the rise of wealthy and young and increasingly wealthy consumers all across Southeast Asia. That to me is one of the biggest stories in the last 30 years. The nature of the spend of that consumer can be broken down a couple of different ways, KP. There's firstly the interest in travel, so share of wallet to travel, which is where you're focused. But there's also the growth of brands. And I know that's something you're yeah. very focused on. It's not just Western brands trying to penetrate this massive market. It's homegrown brands. Talk to us a bit about that too. Well, you, it, it's not so apparent when you read how the big um, luxury brands like LVMH, you know, Gucci, Hermes, more than 50% of their business comes from China. Yeah. So you would think that um, the growth of consumerism in Asia only involves the, r the rise and the prosperity of the big global brands. Now that's true to a great extent, particularly among the nouveau riche uh, in China. Right. But I think below that undercurrent, you at least I've seen it in, in my 30 years in this business, the rise of much smaller boutique brands in the rest of Asia, and now even in China itself. Mm. Um, when I first started into this, in, in this business, it was largely because the business that I inherited from my father was mainly involved in doing contract manufacturing, right. OEM yep. work. We, we did everything. We, we assembled television sets, we built, we, we had a canvas shoemaking company selling things to Adidas. So we've done all that. Mm. And the one thing I learned was that you, you're always running to stand still if all you've got as your relative advantage is cheap labor. Yeah. Because you don't own the customer. Mm. And that's also the story of Asia, including China in the past. Mm. Producing cheap things, well, produ cheaply producing even expensive things um, for the rest of the world. That is beginning to change. Now, Korea, for example, was known as a place that produces really very cheap goods. Japan, right after World War II, was a place where cheap goods were made, now right. no longer. Korea was that country. Now Korea has Samsung. Korean cars are not seen as cheap cars anymore. That's sort of happening in the rest of Southeast Asia. And when you imagine a country like Indonesia with close to 300 million people, yeah. increasingly wealthy, the you know, global investors may not realize it but because they're not close enough to the ground. But in Indonesia, in the Philippines, everywhere, if you go there long enough, you'll see domestic brands beginning to grow. Jollibee is, yes. bigger, is, is, is going to be as big as McDonald's. The McDonald's of the Philippines. And yeah, yeah. from the Philippines. Yeah. And, you know, 
uh, Tony Tan from, from um, uh, Jollibee, started so humbly. Um, Jollibee was only for the Filipino lower end of the market, which people would take McDonald's, but they're spreading their wings elsewhere. And that's just one story. Right. So I think this is, to me, the most exciting story about Asia, which if, if you're far away in London and New York and your nose is not close enough to the mm -hmm. ground, then you don't see the potential for investing in these young companies, many of which are startups. So startups don't always have to be tech. There right. are a lot of other companies, startups in fashion, startup in food, startup in many other areas. And they, I think if one gets in early enough and you follow them as they grow, there's huge potential for investments. It's interesting too to see that cultural translation from the East to the West and going, in the other direction, you mentioned Jollibee. I think I saw, and by the way, it's delicious, everyone. I, I saw an outpost, I think, open in San Francisco when yes. I was there. I was thrilled to see it. Korea, K-beauty, best innovation in the world right now, K-pop. Does that excite you, seeing it go well, the other way? Well, uh, yes and no. It doesn't particularly excite me, for example, uh, as an Asian, I'm very proud that Michelle Yeoh got an Academy yeah, Award. Yeah, absolutely. But then the question I ask myself is, why should she feel that she's validated in her sense of self-worth only when she gets an Oscar? Mm, interesting. Why are brands and fashion designers in Asia feeling that they make it? Everybody feels that they've made it if somehow they are recognized in America. In the West, interesting. That is changing. Yeah. And that to me is more exciting. So I think it's great that Jolly Bee is going to have you know, outlets in, in New York, London, and so on. But they, the, the key point here is they don't need to. So they, I think a lot of the confidence of Asia today is at, is at a point where your self confidence now derives from the fact that in your own area, your mm. backyard, in Asia itself, there is that purchasing power. For example, Japan is experiencing an incredible tourism boom. Yeah. And it's not from Americans and Europeans coming. Yeah. The biggest travelers, are, besides the Koreans and the Japanese, are Thai people. Now, a, you know, a generation ago, Thailand would be seen as basically a place of sun, sea, sex, where everybody else goes to. The Thais have become so wealthy, they're actually traveling in Japan. So. To me, as a person who's pretty old in this business, the, the validation of your sense of self-worth from your own peers, mm. because they now have the consumer power to do that, that to me is actually more important. So no doubt Banyan Tree is in 25 countries, we're in Mexico, we're in Cuba, we're in Greece, we're all these great places and yeah. I love them all, but I don't feel I'm, I'm validated simply because now um, I've got hotels in the West. I'm validated because the area that I'm in, which yeah. is the fastest growing area in the world, that's where I play, and that's where I establish my own sense of worth. To that point of frustration, KP, when you see you know, winners, local winners try, trying to go West for validation, the, the pet peeve I have is in the West, is I'm half Asian, I've been educated in the West, I live in the West, is people talk about Asia as though it's one big homogenous Absolutely. place, right? And you've just broken down, there are different cultural elements in every nation. No one would look at Europe and say Germany is the same as France, mm -hmm. is the same as Italy. Banyan tree has grown very rapidly the last couple of years across the region. Talk to us a bit about what it's taken to take into account the, sp the special cultures of each of the different Asian nations, not just treating it I think as one place. Um, but that's a very interesting thing because uh, it ties into the larger picture about fashion, luxury, and mm. so on. I think a lot of the older brands um, have prided themselves on the idea that they come from a particular culture mm. and everybody else wants to partake of that culture. Right. For example, French fashion, Italian fashion, and so on. Yeah. They are quintessentially French or Italian, and that's such a core part of what they are that you want to buy that Frenchness yes. and so on. We have always said in Biontree, the source of our success is that we play up a sense of place. Mm. Now, first of all, Singapore isn't a very big place, so I could never try to 
South Bayantry as being, you know, culturally Singaporean. <laughs> but that's not the point. The mm. point is that for me, and at least for the hotel industry, I, I want people to come to our Bayantries precisely for the reason that they, for the different reason than why they go to a Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn trades very successfully because it's the same cookie cutter wherever you go. Right. And that's what people want of a Holiday Inn. But today, I think consumers, when they travel and experience the world, they want to experience the location itself, mm. the uniqueness of every, every culture. So we are in 25, 27 countries. And so each one of them try to be different, mm. but they are united in the same sense of service, culture, and so on. That, that we think we have developed. Now, that's just for buying tree. But I think you will also find that um, quite a number of successful brands, an interesting one, for example, uh, two interesting ones, uh, Uniqlo is yeah. not, is very Japanese, but yeah. it's not quintessentially Japanese. Mm. And now another fast fashion company, I don't know how to pronounce it, although it's Chinese, it's Shane or Shane, Shane, Shane yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, they're Chinese, but you, they don't, try to be Chinese, they're like a Zara or an H&M. Yeah. And the Zara and H&M is also interesting. You're not particularly aware that maybe H&M is Swedish owned or Zara or, and Ikea and so on is necessarily, you know, uh, Scandinavian. Yeah. I think the rise of global culture where there's a sense of place to whatever you buy, um, but you try to transcend the idea that, a, that that particular nationality is key to your product that's beginning to grow. And that's certainly in my industry, and I think it will grow more and more elsewhere too, even in fashion. Let's, let's also tie that into brand. I've just uh, come from 10 days in Japan. I did see that one of your banners has opened in Kyoto. Talk to us a little bit about growing across Asia, using different brands to address different consumers in that growing middle class. Well, th that's quite interesting because if you, our origins were as a tropical, uh, sort of tropical resort. We originated the idea of pool villas, mm. the original idea of tropical garden spas, which is now everywhere. There's but a spa here, by the way. There's one here, by the spa way. here yes. at the MBS. Yes, which you're going to after. Yes, exactly. Hope. Everyone is going to after. But, um, but that's been, you know, that's been very successful where we go to climates that are relatively tropical, whether they be Mexico, Cuba, Greece. Yeah. Still, Greece is tropical, but it's sufficiently warm. But if you go to temperate climate places, um, and particularly, let's say, China or Japan, what is amazing to me is that we have already about 35% of China and 45% um, Asian in our workforce. You have your mic working. My, uh, my mic there we is go. back on now? Yes. Okay. But, but and we have now 10 hotels in Japan and more, and we have five or six hotels in Korea. And what is really interesting to me is that even for me as a non-Northeast Asian, mm. I have a tendency to think, oh, China, Japan, Korea, they're all Northeast Asia. Mm. But of course, they're very, very different, very different countries. Yep. So we're now in the midst of developing a binary ethos and style, mm. a brand book for China. And a co we're creating a totally different, different one for Japan. So, and yet they're all Banyan trees. They have to, the challenge is for us, how to make it still quintessentially banyan tree. There right. must be certain attributes that must be common. But at the same time, uh, if you've been to, you know, onsen ryokans in Japan, mm -hmm. they're, they're really so quintessentially Japanese. Yeah, very so unique. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And we want to capture that. Um, so everywhere we go, I think the tendency today now for, for consumer companies that are coming up Mm. And if you're going to try to be, if you're trying to compete against the French, the Italians in fashion, if I try to compete against the American huge companies like Marriott and, and, and so on, mm. and I try to be like them, I'm not going to make it. I have to have something else that's very different. Mm. And I think that point of difference will be the univers universality of what you're selling, but at the same time very rooted in its own local context. And that is, I think, the future of uh, consumer goods um, in Asia. Let's shift gears a little bit, but pull on the insights, KP, that you've gleaned from the fact that you have been growing quickly in China, particularly mm. in recent years. You've been um, doing business in China for a long time. 
today, actually when the US wakes up, there's a big meeting. We've got Presidents Biden and Xi Jinping meeting, I believe, today in San Francisco with APAC. D you've said in, uh, on many occasions that you feel that there is a real misperception mm. of doing business in China with Chinese entities in the West. Talk to us about what you think that misperception is. What, what, are, what are we getting wrong? I think for the, probably for China, which is in many ways more capitalistic than one would think, right? It's in some we'll come back to that, yeah. More we're capitalistic dig into that. Than, yep. than the US yep. um, in terms of at the grassroots level how people compete like crazy. Um, but probably for a large economy, China has got the greatest disconnect between the investable markets, public markets, uh, attractiveness, and yet the inherent strength of the economy, meaning in most other places like the US, UK, and in, in, in Asia, if the stock markets aren't doing very well, if the public markets are not doing very well, it's a reflection of the economy as a whole. Because China is such a strange economy in many ways, in many ways it's very state-directed, in many ways it's also free market capitalism too, um, like in, within the property sector. It's been free market capitalism for a long time and that's why they're having so many problems. So what you have in China today is a situation where, yes, it's not investable in the public markets, largely because there has been quite a lot of state um, intervention, not necessarily for the bad, not the way the Western media puts it that this dictator Xi Jinping is now getting rid of Jack Ma, getting rid of this. Um, the Western media doesn't write it the same way when the EU decides to regulate Microsoft um, or Facebook for antitrust reasons, it's seen as just regulators coming in. But when regulators go into, into China and then you know, take down Jack Ma, so to speak, mm. um, it's seen as a dictator doing it. Can I just push you a little bit on this? Because let's take the Microsoft example that, right. that you just raised, KB. Yes, Mike, the Microsoft Activision deal, for example, the regulators in Europe, the US came in and said, uh, not happening. But at least there was an opportunity for Microsoft to say, OK, if we do X, Y, and Z, we will offset and mitigate some of your fears. And eventually, that deal is going through. The perception is that that back and forth, that dialogue, and the compromise maybe wouldn't happen in China. Is that a false? No, but I think in what y you're seeing is uh, um, uh, Alibaba had to pay a huge fine mm -hmm. for antitrust practices. Right. Um, their IPO was denied. Yeah. Now it's going to be allowed. They're going to be broken up um, because I think, but rightly or wrongly, I think the state perceives that the rise of an sort of oligopoly in China in key sectors mm. and too much money yes. going there um, is not good for the economy. Plus one more point that is clearly political and that's something that makes it not very investable for, China is not investable for Western funds but uh, I'll, and I'll get back to later right. about the state of the economy is right. quite different, right? And, and that is the fear of the weaponization of foreign direct investment into China. Mm -hmm. So don't forget that everything that the US has done with sanctions and so on, weaponizing of SWIFT um, and the US currency has scared the rest of the world that's got, big, that's got big economies but not necessarily US inclined, whether it be India to Brazil and particularly China. So China is now quite clear that they don't want to have a situation where any part of the economy can be weaponized mm. by a antagonistic um, country such as the US. So it's not investable at all right now. And it's not also not investable because although in many ways it's a very competitive economy with people competing with each other, the state definitely intervenes in ways which are not transparent. So you could really lose a lot of money there. So put that to one side. I think China is not investable right now. But not being investable doesn't mean that the economy is in dire straits. Um, too much is made out of the property collapse. I think what's happening in the property sector actually is very good. You do? Yeah, because what China has been trying to do is they, in the past, you've had property crises. And every time the Chinese government came in and w leaving aside moral hazard, basically saved everybody. Mm. They've finally come to realize now that the property sector has got to try for a soft landing right and the soft landing is actually to let to let 
natural market me mechanisms um, take its place for the demise of Evergrande and Country Garden. These are the two big private developers who are going to go bankrupt. And I think the Chinese government is going to let them go bankrupt. And their biggest concern isn't the loss of shareholder equity, which is perhaps a big thing for investors. Their concern is that the hundreds of thousands of people who have bought houses are not going to be left stranded. Right. Otherwise, there will be a revolution in China. Right. And I think the end game here is that they're going to let these companies go bankrupt with the normal course of events. All the unit holders, the bond holders will all go bust. The banks who have invested in them or lent the money will go bust. Then the state sector will come in, the state-owned uh, property developers will come in and finish the homes in order to deliver these homes to the buyers. And they can do that unlike in the US if you have a layman crisis or elsewhere because the levers of economic control in the West are a lot less. Mm. China still has so many state-owned enterprises, even right. in the property sector, that are very healthy. They'll just move in. The, the final part of why I think China is, as an economy, not necessarily investable for Americans, is that it is a state-directed economy, mm. and they are go moving very rapidly into advanced manufacturing, AI, and so on. Right, yeah. And they're smart enough to know that Mr. Xi himself ain't gonna know what AI to invest in, nor even his economic advisors. What they're doing right now that many people are not aware is that there's so many Chinese P fund managers who sort of cut their teeth, like you did, in Goldman Sachs and elsewhere. Yeah. They were then working for these P funds in China many of them left of their own volition to start their own funds, mm. which are now getting state money, yep. not direct Ministry of Finance money, but so many you know, Chinese pension funds, insurance companies, are putting money into Chinese PE funds yep. and telling them, of course, they're directing them generally to say, don't invest in internet-based stuff because that's old world, invest in AI, invest in advanced manufacturing, in robotics. And these PE funds, mm. headed by Chinese people who have been trained in Goldman Sachs and KKR and so on, they are actually investing very heavily in these areas. So we, if you put all that together, I think the Chinese economy, going through a bad spell, bad spell right now, no doubt, is going to be a very strong economy, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's that easily investable. So the disconnect here is how do you as a foreign investor find a way somehow mm -hmm. to find a fund in China where perhaps you can put some money because they do know where to invest. It is the return profile of those Chinese funds, KP, likely to be different or is the mandate, the target different, just given the... Just the given yeah, the you, that's a very good point. Experience. I mean, why sovereign wealth uh, funds are going into China, mm. family offices are going into China, not your traditional American PE fund, because if you have an exit horizon of five plus two, yep. uh, you'll be taking a big risk with China. Mm. Because I don't think the Chinese government is keen to have, start they're keen to fund startups, but they're not keen to have startups that then become unicorns. The, the idea of uh, Uber, uh, WeWorks, startups that can actually grow from zero to a unicorn because of investor sentiment, that, and that's how PE funds get rich when they exit um, that's not likely to be the, the scene in, in China. So it's, lo it's the long return funds, family offices, right. and others that will probably invest in China. I want to get a final thought from you. I know we're coming up on time here, KP, but climate sustainability mm. is such a huge topic right now. And China's role in advancing those agendas has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. And the body language has seen you know, more focus on really trying to lead in these areas globally. What's your perspective on that? You've done a lot for sustainability. It's at the core of, of your own brand. Where's China playing a role here? What is China playing a role in? In sustainability. I think, yeah. well, if, if you just look at the, the issue of renewable energy, um, this is where, the, where you actually get a real case of state-directed, mm. um, um, I guess, investments which, you know, somehow all the Milton Friedmanites in the world think that anything that's got state involvement and including Biden's industrial policy is all bad and everything should be laissez-faire and so on. 
But here, to cases where China, even being quite smart as a country, has realized that if it wants to get into the automobile industry, to try to beat the, the, big, the big companies of the world is going to be impossible. So they invested heavily in EV. Yep. They invested heavily in renewable energy. They're leaders in battery technology. So in many of the sustainable new uh, industries in the world, China is actually leading the way. In terms of its doing its own work in China, China is well aware, being a very authoritarian government, but also aware of the 5,000 years of Chinese history mm. that the, the, the Communist Party isn't afraid of elections. They're afraid of revolutions. China has been so full of revolutions when people don't get the goods that they've been promised by their leadership. And pollution is such a huge problem in China today that if they don't solve the problems of pollution within China, it's not COP28 that's going to be bad for them. It's the Chinese people basically saying down with this leadership because my children are growing up in a world where they're going to die young. That's the biggest fear to the Chinese government. And that's also why they're taking a lot of steps um, on, on improving the, the environment for their own, the survival of the Communist Party. Final words there from KP Ho, founder and chairman of Banyan Tree. Thank you very much for your time. It's been Thank a you. great conversation. Thank you.